You are looking live inside Blue Wire Studios at the Win in Las Vegas, Nevada. It is episode 634 of the podcast. Jack O'Hara here with you alongside Jake Shannon. He's the host of the number one podcast. He flew in from Denver to be here with me today. Huge pro wrestling advocate, uh, owner of Scientific Wrestling. He's got a couple camps coming up. Uh, he gifted us with a few gifts today. He's got his book here with Billy Robinson, uh, Physical Chess. You can check it out right here. Um, thanks so much for coming in today. I really appreciate you dropping by and bringing all of these great gifts. So here's the book, Physical Chess. And then here's here's the other one that you bought that uh, you wrote as well. This one I'm very interested to read. I know we were talking about this when we met a few uh, weeks ago. Uh, thank you and shout out to uh, Michael Anthony for inviting me to dinner at Cleaver Steakhouse where I met Jake and his lovely wife and all of their lovely friends. Um, but I appreciate you uh, making the flight out here today. We're going to talk a lot of pro wrestling today. Dude, like when we hung out at that dinner, I actually felt bad. Because what happens is when you get two people that are totally nerds for a subject, it's like the rest of the room just disappears. Yeah, <laughs> like I felt yeah. so bad because I knew that I was like dominating your whole attention with this. But like, you know, when you find somebody that's as deeply into, well, in this case, wrestling <laughs> a- as you are, like, man, we just started going, like, deep down, like, 20 rabbit holes at once. Like, hours. Eventually, Michael's just like, hey, I want to introduce you to someone on the <laughs> other side of the entire table of 10 awesome. people. I was super stoked. To, that, you made my night. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's WrestleMania season for WWE. Uh, you tried calling me a few weeks ago. I was actually ringside at an AEW event in Phoenix, which was nuts, which was always an exciting time. Tony Khan's really kicking it over there. Got a chance to interview him during Super Bowl week because... Evidently, he's the owner of the Jacksonville Jaguars, too, and he had some NFL business to take care of. Um, But there's a lot going on. You got a lot going on. Um, We've talked a lot about, obviously, scientific wrestling, it being a shoot wrestling company, which is very intriguing. Yeah, I'm trying to take a whole different angle, you know, um, because we have fallen in love with professional wrestling as the rest of the world has. I mean, you know, I can't remember. I think it's Raw is the longest running oh, yeah. TV show. Ep- um, episodic program in television history. Yeah, and then, and then like, WWE is in the top 10 YouTube channels. Like, they're doing a valuation because all this potential sale. It's, like, like, over $7 billion with a B dollars valuation. You know, it's a very big, impactful company that's touched so many lives. Right, and and it's not just WWE. I mean, the entire industry. So AEW, New Japan Pro Wrestling, mm-hmm. like all these fantastic organizations. And the thing for me, because of the way I came up with guys like Billy Robinson or Carl Gotch, these shooters, um, I, I'm like, man, I could see, yeah, WWE. I get it. You guys are crushing it, seven billion dollars. Like, you can't argue with that kind of success. And yet, there's another company here in Vegas called the UFC that sold for $4 billion in a fraction of the time. And I'm very into the UFC as well, or mixed martial arts at large, in particular, submission grappling side of things. And I was like, man, I cannot believe I am the only guy doing pro wrestling competitively. Mm-hmm. Like, I get it. WWE, AEW, that's the John Wick. And it sells and it's awesome. Like, well, everybody loves John Wick. Everybody loves, like, Ricochet or these guys doing these crazy things, right? But I'm like, why can't we have a seat at the table mm-hmm. to shoot people? I'm mm-hmm. not saying, I, I do think that maybe, like, the UFC could learn from the WWE. This is what I'm doing with Shoot Pro Wrestling, which is what we're talking about, this promotion I'm starting. And that is, okay, every UFC fight is the same format. It just gets stale. Mm -hmm. WWE, they've got like tables, ladders, chairs. They've got tag team, triple threat. You know, all these varieties. Royal Rumble match. Royal Rumble. Insanely exciting. Hardcore matches. Like all this stuff. So what is that? What is it that WWE, they're a variety show. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, man, 
why don't we have a seat at that table? You could create a whole separate shoot division, keep a shoot title, keep your guys that could shoot, like Otis, Dolph Ziggler, Kurt Angle, well, he's too old now, but like uh, all these guys, Brock Lesnar, Ronda Rousey, Shayna Baszler, all these people that can actually go, you can mix them in. And, you know, we know that they're pulling all those people from MMA because they need the legitimacy to put somebody like Roman over. Mm -hmm. Why do you have to go to another promotion? Wouldn't it be more cost effective to just do this in house? Mm -hmm. That's my vision: is to get the shoot back on the menu. Yeah, and and this is an episode for pro wrestling fans. So for those of you that don't know what a shoot or a work is, a work is acting. Obviously, like it's it's a part of the script. You know, they're doing what they're told. Whether it was Vince behind the scenes, now Paul Levesque, Tony Khan, and other companies. Billy Corgan and NWA, whatever. Theatrical. Where, yeah, exactly. Like, it's a part of the script, even though it looks real. You know, there's been a lot of those back in the day. Obviously, um, the Bret Hart, Vince McMahon situation, that was a shoot um, because Bret Hart was threatening to leave the company with the WWE Championship and take it over to WCW, so they had to take it from him in the most controversial way in the history of the business. Um, there was a few years ago, Pat McAfee and Adam Cole from NXT, who's now in AEW, they had a they had a thing on Pat McAfee's show that turned into a match at, in NXT that a lot of people still in the business say today was um, a shoot. But there's a lot of people that could easily say that that was a work too. It's kind of still up in the air. But the difference between a work and a shoot is a work, it's scripted, it's theatrical, where a shoot, that's real. It's competitive. Yeah, it's real. And it's just like UFC. And so, you know, with like Shoot Pro... Um, I've done, I did, I've done three shows, right? An MVP, right? So hopefully people who tune in for business too won't be totally turned off by all the wrestling because I'm way into business. That's like my whole number one brand, right? Is like business coaching and consulting. But with, with this shoot pro wrestling, dude, I've done like shoot pro two was a tag team tournament. Mm -hmm. I had legit world-class level grapplers, guys who've won all this stuff and, MMA or, or grappling or jiu-jitsu or whatever, and had them actually get in the ring under professional wrestling rules, as everybody understands it, pin or submit. You know, like they say it in almost every SmackDown, pin or submit, pin or submit. Yeah. Well, that's what we're doing. And for those people that are really deep down the rabbit hole of, of wrestling and pro wrestling, and the shoot in particular, I, I sometimes I have to, <clears throat> excuse me, pinch myself because I have literally been able to corral and marshal the greatest names in that area, mm -hmm. like Billy Robinson, like Carl Gotch. Carl Gotch, in fact, co-developed the rule set for Shoot Pro. This is the guy who was instrumental in Pancras for MMA people, or Shuto. Shuto was the first MMA organization almost 10 years before UFC. Mm -hmm. at New Japan. He was in Inoki's Corner yeah. against Muhammad Ali. This is a seminal character, right? So I'm very blessed, but <clears throat> you know the, the reality is, is that I'm super good in entrepreneurship, uh, it, it bootstrapping it, but I'm at the level where I need a Tony Khan. I exactly. need a Fertitta. I need a, a Corgan. I need somebody who believes in the vision that won't mess with the vision, mm -hmm. and that's hard. Mm -hmm. Oh, every, everybody wants their fingers in the, in the cookie jar, right? Well, and the thing is, is to go after those guys, you know, because they got the money, they got the funding, they got the clout, whatever, the connections. Yeah. The challenge is, is those guys are few and far between. And there's 5 million people all chasing them, pitching them their ideas. So, oh, yeah. you know, my thing is, is I'm just going to push ahead and do the very best I can. And then eventually, I mean, I've been actually doing at this, pro this particular project 20 years. This is our 20th year. Um, but, you know, when you do something you love. You keep doing it. It's a part of your identity. You can't yeah, let it go. It truly is. It truly is a part of my identity. I can't let it go. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting concept because I had a few questions. I remember asking you, like, what if you had a shoot match between Brian Danielson and Brock Lesnar? Like, how does that work? Mm -hmm. or, like, in the UFC, you have weight divisions. Like, you have to ha be physically eye for an eye, match for match with these competitors. Or like in in a shoot wrestling match, like it, it's still theatrical. Like you still cut promos, but once you're in the ring, it's, it's go time.
but so there are weight classes with what we do. Yeah. Right. We have heavyweight, super heavyweight, junior heavyweight, middleweight. You know, we have all of this. If, if people are actually interested, that you can see the the uh, the rule set and you can see the roster, the high level guys that we've already got involved, and you can watch some of the shows. They're all on YouTube as well. Just shoot pro wrestling. Um, but you can go to shootprowrestling.com and actually see the rules. So we've done a tag team, which is absolutely amazing. And what we do is we do a combined weight. So the team can't be yeah. over 525. So you'll get like, yeah. we literally had one team <clears throat> that were middleweights against a team that were heavyweights. And you'd be surprised. The middleweights did amazing. They did amazing. But it is so crazy, you know, as you actually try to do this and pull it off and make it real versus a controlled product. Mm -hmm. Like, dude, I learned I need two refs on tag team matches. Oh, yeah. Because I need somebody on the outside and I need somebody in. There's so much action going on. And we have like a stipulation to keep it just like tag team where, you know, like the thing is with, with pro wrestling, it's become a farce that the rules like, especially during like the Attitude Era, you know, just somebody run in or mm -hmm. you can't do that. Right. in a, Like you don't see a run in on UFC. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? So we, what I've done though, to keep some of the, the, the appeal of the tag teams in the worked method was when there's a tag, whether the person's conscious of it or it's a blind tag, there is um, 10 seconds of interference time. Mm -hmm. Two on one. So the ref starts counting and you got... And in a shoot, 10 seconds is a long time. It's a time. long time, dude. And it becomes like a street fight, man, because it's two on one. And it's so fascinating. It's fascinating to watch oh my what God. really happens. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm th trying to think, like, ri you mentioned Ricochet earlier. He's in a tag team with Braun Strowman right now, right? <laughs> so, like, look at that. Like, over under 525? Maybe. Well, it's hard with WWE because they'll take a five foot eight guy and say he's six foot. Yeah. So, so I don't, you Like, know. AJ Styles and Omos were tag team partners at one point, right? <laughs> right, It's right. like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, that could be very dangerous in a two-on-one -on attack. I'm trying to think who else, like, uh... Uh, I'm trying to think. RK Bro, one of my favorite tag teams of all time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hardy Boys, talk about hardcore. Um, Edge and Christian, all those. Um, Dudley Boys. I'm trying to think like a few different um, unique tag teams that they had, though, where it was like a big guy, like Jericho and Big Show. Well, they, you know, the Dudleys did have Spike That's for right. a while, right? But he was just like, Used, man. Yeah. <laughs> and just, then there was like Tommy Dreamer and all those hardcore guys. Well, what's interesting about the tag teams is beyond seeing what it what it really looks like, right? Um, it's neat because some of the strategies actually work, like cutting off the ring. Yeah. Like that's actually a super good strategy in a shoot tag team match. So all these guys, you could see them kind of learning this stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's just, it's really fascinating to watch it for real. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of mind-blowing. And, you know, I've been to UFC shows. I've been to WWE shows. I haven't gone to an AEW show yet. Um, but, you know, I've been to these big shows, and I will, t I will put my product up on the Pepsi Challenge mm -hmm. that the audience eats it up. The yeah. excitement is every bit as exciting as you would see in a theatrical scripted match. All you really need is that one big event, kind of like how Cody put together All In back in the day. Like, that got AEW rolling. That's what That's got it. Tony Khan's attention, right? You need that one event for people to invest in and really make it count. Yeah, and I've got a good Rolodex for the athletes and stuff, but, you know, on the production side is where I am kind of on the hunt right now. So um, I 100% agree with you. You know, that All In mm -hmm. event was seminal. And I feel that my product sits right, you know, like if you imagine a Venn diagram, those overlapping circles, the little overlap is called the Vesica Pisces. And that's right where I sit. Mm -hmm. And I own that space. And I'm just waiting for somebody in a position of massive influence to see the vision. Mm -hmm. So I, it's an exciting time. It's really an exciting time with that. But, you know, that's just uh, my latest phase in this 20-year journey that has been scientific wrestling, right? So. You know, I started in 2003, and, you know, <laughs> there was a couple of things that happened to me personally that made me realize the efficacy of this. Uh, you know, I had actually been doing 
pro wrestling. I had um, trained with Ultimo Dragon down at his place in now Calpan, Mexico, with the guys from T2P, uh, if you ever mm-hmm. followed the Toriumon promotion, um, Yoshino and, and uh, Milano Collection, and right. those guys. And then um, I then trained with a, um, another Japanese group. They, uh, NOAA had a satellite school called Pro Wrestling Iron or Pro Wrestling Tetsuo, Puro Resu Tetsuo, which is iron in Japanese, I guess. I don't speak the language. And uh, I was doing that. I had had a lot of experience doing the jiu-jitsu and grappling prior, but had found better success in pro wrestling uh, in terms of exposure and personal goals I was having for myself at the time. And while I'm doing working with these Japanese guys, I'm realizing in practice we're shooting. It's just the show is predetermined. That's right. So I'm like feeling like I'm halfway there. But now I'm like, well, why can't we just keep going? Because I've got this shoot background. You know what I mean? And it's just... I couldn't overcome it in those because they were already doing it their way and making money, and the, you know right. they weren't going to listen to me. But um, I had that experience, and then Sakuraba, who was a pro wrestler, came up through the UWFI, which it was a worked shoot. It was meant to look like a shoot, but mm-hmm. the outcomes were still predetermined. Um, he started cutting through all the Gracie jujitsu guys like a hot knife through butter, oh butter, and he's like. You know, he's saying, like, pro wrestling. I'm a pro wrestler. And, like, to have a pro wrestler beat those guys at that time, you know, saying that would be like me saying to you something about, like, flat earth theory. Yeah. Like, 99% of people just look at you sideways. Like, a a pro wrestler beat this Gracie family. But I had this, like, confluence of events, and I could see these holes on the grappling side of what was being done with the jiu-jitsu, which was the predominant thing being taught. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you know what? I don't see anybody doing this. This is like the entrepreneurial thing, right? Like you see a hole in the market and I'm like, nobody else sees this. It's like how I see a hole right now with Shoe Pro. And I'm like, I, nobody sees this? I'm going to fill this spot. And I did. And that's that vacuum that I filled attracted Carl Gotch, Billy Robinson, mm-hmm. all these high-level guys. And it just blew my mind. Mm-hmm. It's been an incredible journey. I mean, just think of all like the high-level um – feuds, I will call them because they are feuds, that are storyline based and they're all works right now. Like, let's look at WWE with like the Usos and Sami Zayn, right? Mm. That's been like a nine, ten month journey. Imagine if that was more so a shoot than a work with that entire buildup and all the drama that's come with it. Even with Cody and Roman right now, they're mentioning Dusty Rhodes, I feel like, in every promo and really digging deep. Paul Heyman's just a master at that on the mic, just a promo god for someone who's never stepped foot in the ring. Yeah. You know, like, if those were shoots as opposed to works, just how personal and how much money would be invested. Dude, look at somebody like Conor McGregor. Mm -hmm. He's figured it out on the shoot side. Now, he goes over the edge because I think he drinks too much and has too much testosterone replacement therapy going or something. So, you know, he's actually assaulting people and doing dumb things. Yeah. But, like, he, he made his money because he's not the best MMA guy. He just, he's just not. Like, statistically, it's, like, not even controversial. But he's the richest. Mm-hmm. And it's because he's doing just like Muhammad Ali. Taking Muhammad Ali took from Gorgeous George on cutting promos. And so this is what I feel with shoot. Like, there's so much to be learned on the business side from – sports entertainment done in the WWE, AEW, mm-hmm. NWA tradition, uh, the work. There's so much to learn, but we could still keep it competitive. Mm-hmm. And the writing is just different. The way you would write it would be different. So, you know, in WWE, the writers, they pull writers from like soap operas and all these other and write like that. Mm-hmm. And that's fine. They do a fantastic job. All you have to do with, think of it this way, you would film it more like a reality show. The show that put UFC on the map, on the map, was Ultimate Fighter. That is a pro wrestling show. Mm -hmm. Because the format is the same, it's just a shoot. So the Ultimate Fighter, think of it, it's backstage vignettes with a bunch of Hormonal, young, aggressive people, all cooped up in one company, and all of the drama is settled in a ring at the end of the show for money. 
that's how you would do a shoot show. It's the same. You do it basically. And the thing is, is reality TV became such a huge thing because it's inexpensive to produce. So I feel like I'm very close on this. Yeah. I feel like I'm so close. Uh, like, you know, at the beginning of, an, of the hockey stick, mm -hmm. of like the exponential curve, like starting to go. But, you know, that's like the story you hear in so many entrepreneurial tales, right? Like, it's not an overnight success story. It's overnight because you just heard about it. Yeah. But somebody's been laboring for decades on this project, yeah. you know. And, but social media will definitely help with that. Keep putting out more clips and keep putting out, you know, exactly. Dude, that's why I'm like, I'm here. Why, this is why we're talking about it, right? You know, <laughs> Dude, like, I'm like, I need the word out and need badass dudes like you that get the vision and are like, dude, how can I help? Yeah. I'm like, shit, man, this is what we can do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Part of my language, but who do you think wouldn't fare well in shoot wrestling when you look at certain characters? Like, from what I like, athletes or characters? Characters. So, like, a guy like Bray Wyatt, that is a character, right? Pro I, wrestling abilities, not, in my opinion, not one of the better pro wrestlers, but from a character developing uh, point of view, one of the most creative minds I think I've ever seen in the wrestling industry with what he's been able to do with his characters. But I don't know if that would necessarily work in shoot wrestling you know listen um what what i recommend from like like this is something that i push I, I haven't heard anybody else talk in these terms but i call it grappling literacy and to me it encompasses amateur wrestling like folk style olympics you know freestyle uh greco-roman even yeah um like scholastic stuff wwe ufc the history of it all that right like knowing actually the subject well and there is a, was a great promotion. So UFC, the Fertitas took it over from the company that started it. And it was started by a handful of people, but most importantly, the Gracie family. It was a promotional vehicle to put over their style of fighting. And while it was a shoot, you could control a shoot through the booking. There was a lot of guys in the world at that time that, in my opinion, could have beat Vice Gracie. Yeah. Well, they just didn't book those guys. They booked a bunch of karate guys. Mm -hmm. And a couple guys that they're like, well, they, they're good enough to look scary, but they don't know how to use like the special things like the gi and things that they were using to, to beat people, right? Now we know that the State Athletic Commission's involved. They don't allow like gis and all this other weird shit. Everybody's got to have an equal footing, right? Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, one of the things that, that, that the shoot, movement and and ufc and all the, these guys i think like there's another the ufc was run like is promoted like boxing because that's where dana white comes from and so it's got a very boxing the promoting is very much like a boxing show but in japan there was a great show called pride fighting championships and i don't know if you ever saw that but that was mma promoted like pro wrestling yeah and they had crazy, ridiculous walkouts and a lot of the theatrical stuff. I don't think they go to the extent that something like they've done with Bray Wyatt or The Undertaker, you know? But I don't see why you couldn't do it. To me, the way you run this, and this recent news of <laughs> WWE now being, you can bet on the outcomes. Right. That's crazy. That, Literally, billions. That's the stupidest thing I've ever Billions of dollars lie in the hands of Paul Levesque now. Dude, it's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. That's a disaster waiting to happen, in my opinion. Do you um, know how many bookings happened last minute? Like, oh, no, we're going to switch the outcome last minute before you go out. All right, you're going out. Like, Lesnar versus Reigns, WrestleMania 31. Imagine betting on that, thinking like, okay, they're looking to put Reigns over. I, I'd maybe make him a little bit over where Lesnar's the under in that. Nobody's going to bet that Seth Rollins is going to be booked to cash in the Money in the Bank contract with five minutes left in the show, and he's just going to steal the title at the end dude it's just really naive yeah. because um like so so there's these two brothers dave schultz and mark schultz they were olympic gold medalists um i never got to meet dave he was like if you ever saw the fox sketcher movie mm -hmm. that's based on their life where he got killed by the weirdo yeah. john dupont the millionaire well i know mark and um, um he and his brother were famous for working their way all the way to the gold medal by choking their opponents unconscious because the ref didn't know what it looked like. Mm. 
choking somebody unconscious is not legal in yeah. freestyle wrestling. So if those two brothers could figure out how to get through the whole system, you don't, you're not telling me some pro wrestler who actually knows how to shoot can't go in there, knock somebody out, have his buddies and everybody bet on him when the, you know, the bet's going the other way or something and make a killer killing. Like, there's just these logistical problems that I just think it's a disaster. So mm -hmm. what I want to do with Shoot Pro is I want to make it bettable in the ring. Everything on the outside, I don't care. Make it theatrical. We can have writers. We can do crazy Bray Wyatt 20-minute entrances, all that. That's fine, and that's where I trust pro wrestling to promote and do a better job. But inside the ring, there's, I personally believe that the pro wrestling rule set is like amazing. Mm -hmm. It drives action. It actually was designed to be a spectator sport. If you go and you watch like a high level jujitsu match or a high level judo or even folk style, it's so boring and tedious with the level of mm -hmm. uh, uh, rules that your average person doesn't know and understand. It'll never be a spectator sport. But wrestling is easy. Pin or submit. Pro wrestling. The same with UFC. Knockout or submit. It's like simple. That's how you're going to get people to spend money and bet. I've always, uh, they've kind of actually ruined something I used to always say. I used to say uh, voting was like betting on pro wrestling. You know? I just ruined that analogy for you. <laughs> now, now I can't use it because I'm like, oh, well, you guys are actually are betting on pro wrestling. It's yeah. ridiculous. I'm trying to think what, because WrestleMania right around the corner, there's a lot of high-profile matches that I feel like are very predictable, that a lot of people would be like, I'll put the under on Cody Rhodes to win the main event of WrestleMania. Why? I mean, it's like betting on, on the Avengers, how it's going to end. Mm -hmm. I just don't even understand it. Like, why don't we bet on soap operas? Like, it's just, it's just a bad idea. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's going to end well. And, I mean, you know, I could be wrong. Like, that's the thing with entrepreneurship is somebody sees a hole and they believe in it and they go and do that. I see a lot of problems. It's like, it's like the slap fight thing. I'm like, okay, I see one thing that's good about it, and the rest is absolutely ridiculous. Oh, my God. The well, one thing is that you can slap put somebody, and it will make it on TikTok because the whole thing can happen in seven seconds. Yeah. But where's the longevity in this? Given that there's, like, a ton of money that's going to be invested, a ton of money that's either going to be gained or lost by a lot of people, you, you got to think that that's got to be something on the mind of – creative whether it be a Paul Levesque or a Tony Khan you know like not that that should be their focus at all but you got to think now like oh Pete, like there's going to be lives ruined based on my bookings yeah right that's awful yeah it's a disaster and like I know they're doing it like some people you uh they allow like betting on the Academy Awards and that's how they're hoping this can be done I don't know man on it where you've got three or four shows a week. Like now you've got this whole expense of securing and it almost goes back to kayfabe. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it really goes back to kayfabe. So now all these smart marks, it's going to be weird. It's definitely disruptive. So maybe it'll be good, but I, I just see a lot of holes. Maybe New Japan pro wrestling. Like N New Japan, in my opinion, is the closest thing to shoot wrestling. At least they make it look like a shoot. They right? present it that way. They I love that. that. Way, which is great. I love it because the production crew films it like they would film boxing or kickboxing. Exactly. It's not like crazy shake the camera every time somebody lands. or Exactly. And the fans are so disciplined. They love the sport of wrestling as yeah. opposed to just like little kids cheering for John Cena, you know, like all that crap. Like they're legitimate pro wrestling fans where like if there's like a grapple on the ground, you they're, they're applauding. They're all applauding in the Tokyo Dome. You're like, oh, I think... Dude, what, what I've seen... Well, there's been a huge change, though, because, you know, when I came up... I'm 50 now, right? And so when I came up, I came up in the era when WCW was its own organization, and they were beefing with WWE, and there was, like, the power plant in Atlanta, and you had to be six foot four and 240 pounds, or you wouldn't even get a look at. Yeah. And to go from that to today with guys like Adam Cole or not even in the WWE, like Zack Sabre Jr. Like those guys would never, ever have gotten a look at in the past. And that's a way, in, in my opinion, things have improved tremendously. You know, a guy like Johnny Gargano or any of these mm -hmm. smaller guys, but they can go and they can do a good job. They're getting respect now. Mm -hmm. That's nice. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, Brian Danielson, I think, was a true pioneer mm. that entire, cause back in his Ring of Honor days. Like, I'll even throw, like, obviously, an AJ Styles. This is a small guy, but the most insanely talented technical wrestler in the world. Uh, even a guy like CM Punk, who didn't really look the part Didn't have in a any good way. look, yeah. You know, didn't have a good look at all. Literally looks like he works at a gas station, right? But he was <laughs> able to get over on the mic, you know? Like, everybody kind of found their niche. Um, it, it's just... I couldn't imagine, like, we, we saw CM Punk in the UFC. It yeah, was it, didn't embarrass- go well. it was embarrassing it didn't to go watch. Well. As a WWE fan watching that first fight, it was like UFC 203 against uh, uh, Mickey, what's his name? I'm going to blank on his name, but um, that's his first name. Just got demolished. Yeah, and the guy was a nobody, because I don't even remember his name either. But it, this is the thing. How you enter into this matters. So you take an MMA guy like Brock, like, or a wrestler like competitive, like Kurt Angle, and you put them in WWE, easy. Mm -hmm. Not the other way. No. Not the other way. Dave Batista did a good job. He did okay. He trained with my buddy Harris Smith, Mm -hmm. who's the son of the British Bulldog. That's right. Who's also involved with my organization. He's a a coach with my organization. Uh, He's in Tampa. But yeah, he trained with him because he's about the same size. Yeah. Harry Smith is a beast, by the way, a legit grappler, like legit shooter, not putting him over and could maybe handle a tomato can. Mm-hmm. He is tough. He's very, very good. Harry. Yeah, no. I mean, there's. I feel like that whole, um, I'm trying to think, like, was it the Heart Dungeon? A lot yeah. of those Canadian guys, yeah. like Jericho and uh, Edge and all those guys kind of trained under Bret Hart's tutelage. Like, that was supposedly really tough. Like, Triple H was trained by um, Killer Kowalski. Mm-hmm. He, he said, like, that, that, that nobody could get away with that kind of wrestling. Well, that's how it was with Billy, too. Yeah. Like, it was, by today's standard, I'm not saying I agree with today's standard. I'm just presenting this because that's who's watching this. They would say that's abusive. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ric Flair was trained by Billy Robinson. Yeah. It was so brutal, he quit. And Vern Gagne actually had to track him down, slapped him, and said, show up. <laughs> and that's, and if he hadn't, Ric Flair wouldn't be Ric Flair. So it was, it was a different era. And, and, you know, there's some people that like to romanticize the past and say, oh, the wrestlers from the old days could crush everybody today. I don't know that that's necessarily true. But I think the opposite is, is not necessarily true either, that everybody today is better than the guys in the past. I think that... You know, I think wrestling the, is wrestling. Yeah, I think the characters were better in the past. Where like you see a lot of insanely athletic people, like a Ricochet or a mm-hmm. Kenny Omega or an AJ Styles. Where back in the day, The Rock and Stone Cold were just pioneers of cutting promos and getting over, having and their nostalgia. They had like four moves. Oh yeah, but they made money. Yeah, there's there's so much crossover learning and growth, I think, from both industries. And that's really where I see so much opportunity. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm-hmm. We'll see, though. <laughs> you just got to get the right... Dana White lives here. Maybe pick pick his brain. Get him in the studio. Dude, I'm a, I'm a crazy man. I've, like... You know, like, this is my passion project. So I, I have a master's degree in financial math. I worked in investment banking. I worked in high levels in, in um, mortgage banking. Uh, my wife and I have a software company that's a leading software company in the industry that it's in. It's called Gate Master for like uh, amusement parks and Mm -hmm. water parks. Um, My number one coaching, I've coached high level C suite executives like CEOs, CFOs, COOs, um, Olympians, all this kind of stuff, right? And I'll be real, like my time probably in terms of like my personal net worth (laughs) is better served in that area. And so I do keep that does take a lot of my time. Yeah. But this is my passion project. This is probably my life's purpose, as crazy mm-hmm. as it sounds. Like even hearing myself say it. But this is probably my life's purpose. Yeah. Given how all this crazy stuff is kind of all those experiences come. I, I want to say they've fallen in my lap, but I've like definitely put myself into those positions. Mm-hmm. Like taken, made sacrifices, done crazy stuff to make it happen. Now in the back of your head, was it all for this to get this over? Or did you take those jobs at the time just to gain those experiences. So what had happened was, um, you know, I, when I was a kid, um, I had cancer when mm-hmm. I was 15. And, I mean, it nuked me. I had just got my black belt at one of these Taekwondo McDojo yeah. things. It doesn't really matter. 
Um, but I was proud of it. And then literally right after I got my black belt, I had six months of chemotherapy, six weeks of radiation, like literally just destroyed me. And it took me out of it for a minute. And I started getting back, built back up because the only thing I knew was martial arts because that's what I did when I was a kid. So I was like, okay, this is what I'll do to get myself back physically. And I was in Colorado. And the first two UFCs were held in Colorado because it was only one of the few states where this kind of fighting was legal. Mm -hmm. And I was able to go to UFC 2 in 1994. And I'm a, I think I was 21. And, dude, that changed my life. I didn't even like pro wrestling. I didn't like pro wrestling until the late 90s. So I was obsessed with UFC, MMA, grappling. And I actually left Colorado. I had an English degree, which is like the most, in 95 when I graduated, it was the most worthless degree in terms of making money. I moved to California, which was like the most expensive state. Yeah. And I was struggling, right? So I went and I hustled up. I, I was like, I got sick of being poor. I remember one time I was working at a bookstore with people without degrees, because that was all I could do with, a, with an English degree. I was working at this used bookstore in San Francisco. It's called uh, Green Apple Books. I had a half hour for lunch. And my one thing that I could do for myself was I, I could have a $2 Chinese food lunch special across the street. So I would run over there, wait in this long ass line, get a scoop in the little white box, hustle back to the break room and have literally like 10 minutes to wolf it down and then get back to work. And I, I was, I thought I was happy, you know, like I was skateboarding everywhere. I had no responsibilities, no kids, this kind of thing. I was feeling the struggle of having no money though. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, okay, I can't actually have a girlfriend. Nobody wants to date me because I can't even afford a car. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm making all these sacrifices for grappling and wrestling, and then I don't have any real way of making money. And one day I'm eating my Chinese food, and I get about halfway through, and I look in the box, and it's like full of cockroach parts. Like I'd already eaten half of it. <laughs> and then what made me absolutely disgusted with myself was I – was so poor and needed the calories and the two dollars meant a lot like that's sad like two bucks but I picked out the remaining pieces and ate the rest and the rest of the day I just was so disgusted with myself and this is something that I think people today don't allow you know I actually like the times I've been disgusted with what I've done or mistake I've made or a wrong path I've chosen those are the most important moments in my life but people get it numbed out with drugs or yeah. distractions and flipping screens or whatever, you know? That was the moment where I said, dude, okay, this is enough. I have, to, and I went back to grad school and I got my master's degree in financial math. Well, because I now had extra money, I could go and get all this training and travel and learn from these guys. Like go to Mexico City, like go, uh, throw down the money for a, a pro wrestling school associated with pro wrestling Noah. I wouldn't have been able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. And I had gotten to this point where I was not connected in the grappling scene. I didn't know any of the Gracie family. They didn't owe me any favors or anything like that. And I, try, I tried to get booked when I was young and, and fit and able to do this. And I couldn't get booked. For the life of me, I couldn't get booked. And I happened to be dating this girl who was a stripper at the time, and she absolutely loved SmackDown. And I hated pro wrestling. I thought I was like I was one of those guys. Like I looked down my nose. I was like, "This is stupid. Why are you into it?" Like, and a friend of mine, because I the other place I worked, this is in San Francisco, besides the used bookstore, I worked in a in a uh, they used to like a blockbuster, but right, it was a right. small business. They rent movies. Right. And I saw Andy Kaufman's "I'm from Hollywood," which is a documentary of his foray that he made into pro wrestling. A lot of Man on the Moon that has Jerry Lawler and these right, other guys in it, right. is based on this. Act. It's amazing. I highly recommend anybody watch this. It's the funniest damn thing. And I've always been a comedy nerd. So now I started to see the value in pro wrestling. And I was being disillusioned by not getting the kind of exposure and you know fame and all the stuff I wanted to get out of this grappling thing. So I went into pro wrestling. And in my first year, dude, I ended up uh, getting booked with the Vans Warped Tour. Traveled the entire un United States making 150 bucks a day as a legit pro wrestler. This was right when WCW was acquired by WWE. 
And so we were actually the number two pro wrestling organization in the world in terms of live audience seeing our shows. And I ended up getting a, a tryout for the first uh, Tough Enough. And I, there was like something like 2,500 submissions, and they only chose 50, and I was one of them. Go out to uh, Times Square when WWE used to have a restaurant there, and they used to do a lot of their shows and stuff. Did that tryout. So pro wrestling was really good to me. But then it was like I got the same disillusionment mm -hmm. where I'm like, these guys who looked like WCW power plant guys are getting over, and I looked like Zack Sabre Jr. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, I could kick your ass if we actually went. Mm -hmm. And I was just so frustrated because I was young and aggressive and stuff. And that's really when I was like, dude, I want to put both together. This is, and I really started studying both businesses. I'm like, man, this is a freaking good idea. So here we are. <laughs> hey, it's coming together. It's manifesting. You're out here kind of sharing the vision. So I'm excited to see where it goes. So how did you get into pro wrestling? Because everybody's to, got a different story. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Because it was always on. Like, Friday Night SmackDown was always something that I knew was a thing. Monday Night Raw kind of came later on when I actually, like, started watching it. My brother always watched it just because, like, pro wrestling, like, people were kicking the crap out of each yeah, other. Yeah, it's you know? wild. But I think it was the original... I think it was right before this, around 2011, 2010, 2011, right before the CM Punk pipe bomb. Mm. We're like that, that to this day, it was like scripted. Vince is like, say what you want, but like within reason. And he kind of went off the cuff. Yeah. Which is kind of a shoot. It and is a shoot. Is it a shoot? Dude, that's the thing that I love is I think the shoots are the big, like you mentioned, like the Bret Hart thing. Yeah. Like the shoots are our money. Nobody's talking about Ultimate Warrior versus Hulk Hogan. People are still talking about Bret Hart versus Steve Michael. Right. Well, or Sean Because it, it's like a relationship breaker, though, right? You're burning a bridge. Like, CM Punk really burned a bridge. But that was, like, um, I was he was my number one favorite pro wrestler for years. And then you get into it, and you see all the different gimmicks. Chris Jericho, I think, is one of the more brilliant guys when it comes to evolving and kind of reinventing himself. Yeah. The, the, the era when he had the list, and he was, like, Kevin Owens' yeah. best friend. Me and my brother ate that up when we were in high school. Like, that was such a good story. Yeah. And then they, they were, like, the second match on the card at Mania. And it was just kind of a bummer to see how that kind of, like, fizzled out. Uh, but there were so many really cool storylines that I really gelled with. Like, I was a huge Seth Rollins guy. Really jumped on AJ Styles when he first came in over. Because I wasn't too big on any of the indie circuits until AJ Styles came to WWE. I'm like, he's a fantastic wrestler. And they immediately threw him in the main event with, like, Reigns and Cena and all those guys. And then I started to look at New Japan because Jericho went over. He fought Kenny Omega. I'm like, yeah. oh, that's, like, the number one guy yeah. who's not in WWE, Kenny Omega. And there was Okada, um, Tanahashi, all these New Japan guys. And I'm like, these guys are incredible. The Young Bucks, seeing the Young Bucks ringside in a tag team match, that was the most brilliant tag team match I've ever seen. Those guys are insanely talented at what they do. Um, but yeah, there were so many, I mean, the John Cena, that was the, the era in our childhood, right? John Cena was the main event every single year. Got to see John Cena versus The Rock at WrestleMania. Oh, wow. Uh, at MetLife Stadium it was the one where Cena won, so the sequel match. Um, yeah, uh, Taker versus Punk. Uh, so I went to Mania 32 in Dallas, um, where Shane McMahon jumped off the top of Hell in a Cell which was insane. Well, that's the other thing I really like about WWE is that it's actually like a legit family business. Mm -hmm. And they've blown it up. I mean, they're like the Walmart of car of uh, combat sports entertainment, right? Like, And to have, like you said, like Shane, like, dude, that guy took serious risks Yeah, for the business. If, he, if, the, ownership, he knew. if the ownership's willing to do that, the guy's getting paid $400,000 a year to do this or like, holy crap, I better do this. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I think Vince was against it, too. He's like, you're not doing that. And I guess they practiced it a few times. And you've seen, like, the documentary. He's about to jump off, and then they cut to Vince and Stephanie in the back, and they're just like, oh, my God. 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 And the guy's not a technical wrestler. He That was his first match back in, like, seven years. He left. Well, he had done that one brutal match with Kurt Angle where he, oh, Kurt the glass. tried to throw him through and jacked him up. Yeah. Like, for real. That like was threw him brutal. through glass. Yeah, and then, like, I think he landed on his head and jacked his spine and all. Like, it was brutal. Like, so, 
Unfortunately for Shane, I mean, he's an entertainer and he wants to make it the most that he possibly can. Given the fact that he's not a technical wrestler, he has to make up for it with these stunts. That's it. I mean, the work, but... That's it, and then you end up like Mick Foley where you can't move. Yeah. You know, it's... Shane's lucked out, though. He's in great shape. I'll tell you, I've... I've, uh, uh, Pro wrestling, like, with the theatrical stuff or competitive grappling, like, actually rolling with people to go... I have some pretty bad injuries from that. I actually only have one carotid artery left mm. from grappling because when I started, when it was Wild West, we were dumb. We didn't know how to train. Like, half the guys that did MMA all have CTE, like the concussion stuff, because they were hitting each other as hard as they could in practice. And then now they've learned, like, no, no, you save that for the fight, right? Well, we were doing the same thing with fighting out of chokes. And I guarantee you that the canvas on a gi or the bone on a – arm is stronger than the carotid artery and mine end up getting totally jacked yeah but that aside there so there are some risks with the shoot stuff but that aside most of my major injuries came from doing the theatrical stuff because it's closer to being like a stunt person mm-hmm. it's rough dude. Mm-hmm. you have to like in in a shoot i could actually actively protect myself i can roll i can i actually have to take bad bumps and put myself in bad positions and trust the other guy yeah in a way and that could be that could be bad. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, right? Bret Hart, to this day, still blames Goldberg for putting him out of the business because he trusted him with some headshots. And yeah, Goldberg gets a bad rap for hurting a lot of people. Yeah, I mean, I try to stay out of it. I don't really know. Yeah, all we know is these guys each have their own experience or whatever. But you know, a guy like Goldberg probably should have gone into MMA, but there just wasn't the money back then. Yeah, you know. Then there was Ryback. Nobody liked Ryback. Yeah, it's interesting because t- I think he would have gotten over in the early 90s. Oh, for sure. Because big he muscle had, dude. He, all of that. Squashed everybody. Yeah, that whole big pop of pump. Like, just a gigantic, scary person. Mm-hmm. But once the internet took over, it just changed the complexion of all media. And things became a far less cartoonish and I think became a little more nuanced. You know? Yeah. And I think, that, I think it's been a good thing, by and large. Mm-hmm. I think one of the issues I will say about a shoot pro wrestling, let's say like WWE from the start was a shoot pro wrestling company. Guys like The Rock or John Cena or Dave Bautista who transitioned over to Hollywood, it would never work with all the contracts and all the all the dates that they have to make, all the movies that would have to stop production because they got hurt or twisted like their ankle or you know popped a shoulder doing, like, the simplest move. And those are your top guys, right? you know? Yeah, I know that, like, um, I think they call that ancillary rights. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, yeah, WWE is like, dude, you come up through us, you ain't going to forget us when you get big. And so The Rock still has to get permission from Vince and all those guys until the ancillary rights run out, right? Well, Dana White tried to do the same thing, you know, speaking about how would this work on a shoot? And it didn't go over so well, right? Like, I know that there's a lot of guys fighting for fighters' rights, yeah. right? Because the, the UFC guys are no, notoriously underpaid. Now, I think Dana's done a lot to rectify that and take care of the fighters and stuff now. But that was a reaction because that was a legit problem, especially when he made the deal with Reebok and took away the ability of these athletes to go get sponsors to pay for their training camp, their coaches. Like, there's all these expenses that most people don't see. That's right. So there was big pushback on the ancillary rights with regards to a shoot organization like the UFC. I know now, I, again, who knows what the actual beef is between Dana White and Randy Couture. Randy claims it's the ancillary rights, um, and uh, Dana White claims – he had all kinds of crazy yeah. stuff to say about Couture. So I don't know what's right. But I do think that, like, I know that Vince has pushed back when guys tried to unionize. You know what I mean? And blackball people from the industry when right. they try to do that. So I don't know. That would definitely be something for, for legal. But I think the advantage would be that in the contracts that are signed to become a part. Let's, so let's say, let's run a thought experiment here in role play that, like, Shoe Pro has enough money where we're signing top-level athletes, Mm -hmm. you would say in that original contract, look, man, I want to put you under contract. 
We're going to put all these cameras on you. We're going to put that expense. We're going to do all this stuff. But if you blow up because of the money we put into you and you go to Hollywood and you're into the expendables or stuff, we need some sort of kickback. Yeah. Some people might sign. Some people might not sign. Mm -hmm. You know? Then it becomes more about a contract than about some, like, union getting involved in third parties. It's just, I prefer things through contracts, but who knows how it would play out. I mean, that is yeah. an interesting question. There's a lot of things to consider, a lot of things that are probably going to happen in the next few years. So I'm excited to see where this goes, man. Uh, I appreciate you. I want to send these guys home eventually. You know, <laughs> yeah. I've, been, I'm, I've been out here for the last four hours with uh, Brian Jones and company. So uh, this was episode 634 of the podcast, guys. Where can we follow you on social media to learn more? Uh, so the two easiest places are Scientific Wrestling. That has all my connections to social media and stuff. Uh, you can watch some of the Shoot Pro shows. You can get involved. Um, and then if you are interested on some of the entrepreneurial things uh, that I do, like the business coaching, uh, we met at 10X Growth Con. That's right. Right? And so I'm actually uh, a 10X business coach with Grant. I'm actually, I've, I've done quite well in my first year with him. I was the number two, even though my company's name is number one. Believe me, the irony is not, I'm actually pissed. I'm like, God damn. But I was the number two coach uh, of, the, of the 10X business coaches in 2022. I was actually the number two producer for, the orga uh, for that organization, that group of guys, uh, last month. Um, so if you do need help with your business, that one is just number one coaching. So you need yeah. to go number one coaching.com or scientific wrestling. .com. Oh yes. Number one coaching.com. The number one podcast is also available. Yep. Jake Shannon. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank the show you today. so much. I appreciate Again, this was episode 634 of the podcast guys. Remember to like comment and subscribe on our channel at Jack O'Hara TV. So long from the win in Las Vegas.